singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a review on iTunes or by becoming a patron, a patron via patreon.com forward slash singularity FM. Today, my guest on the show is a person whom Inc. Magazine called the Oracle of Silicon Valley. Wired called him the trend spotter. His latest book is titled WTF, what the future, what, what, what's the future and why it's up to us. It's uh, this fantastic book that I've been reading this weekend. And uh, if you are curious as per how important uh, his books might be, then let me just give you another quote that says that, quote, the internet was built on O'Reilly books. So without further ado, Tim O'Reilly, welcome to Singularity FM. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thank you for being with us once again. So, Tim, if I were to ask you to introduce yourself, if someone's never heard of you and never read one of your books, and if I ask you to introduce yourself in a sentence or two, who is Tim O'Reilly? Uh, you know, that's a very good question because the Tim O'Reilly that I am to myself is not necessarily the one that I am to other people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, you know, certainly in my professional career, I, I guess I would say that uh, I have been uh, bringing the tools of learning about cutting edge technologies uh, to Silicon Valley for the last 40 years uh, through books, conferences and online learning. So I'm just trying to translate that into a one word. And if, if it's possible at all, bringing the words to the, the tools to Silicon Valley for the last 30 years, what does that make you? Uh, uh, change maker, uh, change, you know? change agent or change maker, yeah, change agent. Yeah. I mean, uh, my, the, the motto that I kind of adopted for my company is changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. So you could call me a, a cross fertilizer or a, uh, uh, you know, uh, or a change agent reagent, uh, catalyst maybe. Yeah, catalyst could be could be if we're going down the chemistry path. But what's the change you're going after, be it personally or professionally? Then, yeah, you know, I think that in one sense, uh, I am simply expressing my own taste, um, as a lot of people do. I, you know, I look at things and I say, "Oh, that's interesting to me. That's a way that the world could go that I like." Uh, I think we all do that. You know, we try to shape our environments from the time we're babies uh, to suit us. And I, I guess I, I have a somewhat, you know, sort of unusual upbringing for a Silicon Valley, um, you know, type because I never took venture capital. I, I grew up, I, I grew up, I started my business with $500. And you know, it was funded by customers. I didn't actually, I've never actually had a job other than being a janitor in college or, you know, a summer job mowing lawns at Arlington National Cemetery. So I kind of made my own rules for business as I was developing my business. Um, and I, uh, the things that I find interesting are often people who are driven by curiosity, you know, whereas there's a lot of, of Silicon Valley is driven by, uh, you know, what's the hot new thing where I can make my fortune. I've always tended to run away from that back towards the, you know, the origins uh, where there's no money to be made yet, but it's just cool and new and interesting. And, uh, you know, so, I, you know, I, I, I just tried to be useful in some sense by finding things that I thought, you know, when I, I look back to the beginning of, of my career, I was a, you know, I, I fell into a, a job as a technical writer. I had a friend who was a programmer who got asked to write a manual. He didn't have any idea how to do it. I thought of myself as a writer. I knew nothing about computers, but I said I'd help him out. And uh, I, I learned to love computers. I, I fell in love in particular with regular expressions. Uh, which are text matching, you know, tool and 
and and then got into you know uh, uh, Sed and Auk and Pearl uh, because it, they gave me you know what seemed like magical power over text. <laughs> you know, so I could uh, you know in my career of being a writer, I could I, I had these power tools that uh, other people didn't have, and. Uh, but a, a lot of what we did as a tech, we, I started this tech writing consulting firm. And then when we didn't have work, we said, well, there's no good manual for VI, the you know, Unix text editor, or there's no good manual for said you know, So we just wrote them. And so we were just in some sense, like in any open source project, they say, you know, you scratch your own itch. We weren't doing it with open source. We were doing it with books, but we were just trying to, to learn and share what we learned. And you you said that you're you're going after aesthetic change, and yet you're trying to be useful. So does that mean that those two things overlap in your view? Because aesthetics perhaps doesn't always overlap with usefulness. Well, yes and no. Uh, it's funny. I remember many many years ago, uh, uh, I, I I had a funny conversation with a woman who's now my ex-wife, but. Uh, uh, I said, I only like useful plants. I like to garden, you know, and I do have a bias towards fruits and vegetables over flowers. And one day uh, we were up in, in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and it was this miniature rose farm. And I went, oh, I love these miniature roses. I'm going to buy one. She says, I thought you only like useful plants. And I said, it is useful. I like it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but more seriously, but this is very serious because Oscar Wilde famously said that art, uh, what makes art is precisely the fact that it is mostly useless for anything else, other than perhaps aesthetics, which he didn't mention, but that's how he defined art. And he wrote this whole paper to a fan who got sort of insulted by kind of, or surprised by that kind of qualification of what art is. And yet it was not in any way intended to diminish art, but simply to separate it and distinguish it or differentiate it. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with Wild because to me, art is profoundly useful. Uh, it, it's something that helps us see the world. Uh, you know, when you think about poetry or music or art, uh, it, it, it sharpens our perception. It, it bridges the gap between things that we feel uh, but didn't know that other people felt. And in some sense, my when I when I see the bridge between art and uh, utility, I'm actually thinking of a concept that Wallace Stevens, the poet, had, which is that in some sense, our the worldview that we all have is an artistic creation. We are sold an idea of how the world should be. And of course, this. Uh, you know, beamed into popular consciousness a couple of years ago in Yuval Noah Harari's book, uh, Sapiens. Sapiens, yeah. He, he tells the history of humanity as the history of, uh, you know, effectively, of storytelling, of lies, in some sense, the ability. He said, look, we get by beyond num Dunbar's number uh, into bigger groups by creating fictions that we could all believe in, you know, whether that's uh, religion or the supreme leader or uh, money, you know, he, he talks about the invention of money and the and the and, and then the invention of debt, you know, which is a, a vision of the future. These are aesthetic visions, and this is something that Stevens talked about. Uh, uh, he has a poem called "Notes Towards a Supreme Fiction," where he talks about the you know uh, you know the search for meaning is as important as the search for God, and in some sense that the the reality that we construct for each other is a constructed reality. That's very interesting because I'm actually working on a book, my second book right now, kind of on and off, and it's called Rewriting the Human Story, How Our Story Determines Our Future. Absolutely. And that's fundamental. And that's my whole thesis there. That's my whole hypothesis that a new world requires a new story to put us all together and sort of push us towards a, a single goal or at least a coherent cohabitation, peaceful peaceful and coherent cohabitation without destroying the planet and so on. And we need a new story. The old stories don't fit anymore. 
Oh, I'm totally with you on that. And, and it, it's funny. Uh, that's actually uh, one of the ideas in some ways that runs through my book that, that you know, the, the point of the second part of the title, It's Up to Us, is that what we believe and the choices we make is what ultimately shapes the future. Let me stop you for a second, though, because I want to get to that, but in a, in a little bit later. I want to do uh, I want to split, split our part in three parts. I want to get a little bit more to know you first. Then I want to jump into the book, which is utterly phenomenal. And I spent three days reading and rereading some parts of it. And and, and actually, um, I want to get to some more general points thereafter. So because you have very interesting education and background, as you said, and that comes from uh, Greek and Latin, doesn't it? That's correct. Right. Because my education was when I started doing tech, this tech blog, uh, and podcast was a philosophy and specifically ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. <laughs> yeah. So Socrates, I mean, Plato, uh, Aristotle, Seneca, Cicero, Lucretius, all the classics, basically. Oh, well, those are all, all, uh, still, uh, wonderful, uh, sources of wisdom today. So tell me, uh, how is it that someone who had the love for Greek and Latin classics ends up in technology? And, and what is it that we can take from one place and bring it to the other that perhaps is lacking? Well, there are probably two threads. And one of them uh, relates actually to the subject of my honors thesis at Harvard, which was about mysticism and logic in Plato's dialogues. And the argument that I made was that there's certain kinds of uh, issues in Plato that scholars, you know, they, they talk in this bizarre language as if ideas only come from other people. So they're like, well, this he's, you know, he's speaking in this mystical language about, you know, uh, these logical themes because he was influenced by the Orphics. And I'm like, no, when things are new, when things are fresh, they are full of mana. You know, they're full of power. And, and all these things that we now rehearse 2,000 years later, you know, the ideas of, of, of Plato and Aristotle, at the time, they were ideas of enormous power and excitement. And of course, you used inflated language about it. Just like, look at people talking about the Internet in, in uh, you know, in 1990. You know, it's like, oh, my God, it's so exciting. And there's all this overblown language about something that eventually becomes part of the everyday. The same is now happening with cryptocurrencies, I think. Exactly. And so there's one bridge, you know, that, that here, you know, uh, Socrates and his circle were the Silicon Valley of Athens in 430 BC, you know, whatever, you know. And so people were pushing the envelope in all kinds of areas. So there's a bridge really to saying, hey, I was really interested, what I was interested in ancient Greece were the people at the cutting edge of the day. But there was another piece that was just sort of a pragmatic piece in my early career. And that was, you know, because Latin and Greek are not spoken languages, you learn them by close textual reading. And when I first entered the computer field, I knew nothing. Uh, you know, I literally saw my uh, first computer the same day I got my first technical writing job. And I had this friend who was a programmer, and I would just ask him questions. And so I was educating myself, but I was also doing pattern recognition. And a lot of tech writing, you know, when you're writing, you know, manuals is actually rewriting of, you know, te technical specs. And I was just re reading them like I would read a Latin or Greek text. I was kind of just doing close reading, going, oh, this goes with that. And doing and so I did really good work often without fully understanding because what I was doing was was parsing. And I also remember uh, uh, the, this great uh, experience once I was I was writing some TROF macros. TROF is a typesetting, uh, you know, uh, language back from the early days of Unix you know, before desktop publishing. And Brian Kernahan had written the manual, you know, the such as it was for T-Roth. And he's a very elegant, very precise writer. And I was, uh, and there's a concept called a trap, you know, where you kind of look at, you can tra trap on a, a plate, a position on the page, or you can trap on, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, various kinds of things. And I'm trying to read, 
I, I'm, I've got some bug in my macro that I'm writing, and I'm, I'm going, I just have to read what Kern Han wrote more precisely because he says exactly what he means. And I, I had this sort of moment of like the close reading and going, oh yeah, okay, now I got it. You know, I, I was, I was, I was, you know, I wasn't paying close enough attention to the exactitude of what he said. And of course that runs <clears throat> through so many aspects of technology where, as one friend said to me, um, uh, uh, in, in a memorable way, he said the skill of debugging is figuring out what you really told your computer to do instead of what you thought you told it to do. And I, I think in general, in our lives. So do you think that ethics and ancient philosophy, especially the Stoic, maybe Greek philosophy, or, or even Socratic uh, dialectical methods of investigation could help us debug uh, technology, as it were? Because that's kind of like the whole premise of, of my blog, my podcast for the last 10 years. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I guess I would say yes, but it, you have to understand it properly because I don't think that most people understand the Socratic method. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they think of it as a logical exercise. And it's not. It's an, an exercise to find the truth. And I, at least in my own experience, the truth is like um, y y you're trying to build an image of the thing that you're representing. And, and, there's a, and this goes, goes back to this aesthetic sense. You kind of have a sense of, yeah, that matches. You know, think about uh, you know, doing a picture puzzle. You know, you're sitting there and you've got all these pieces and they don't quite fit. And then you, you that experience of, yes. That fits. Mm -hmm. It reminds me to Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell's idea of blink. Yeah. Yeah, in some ways, but that search for truth is, is this mirroring where I've built a model in my mind or a, a sense of, yes, I have found the story that matches the reality. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's very easy for people to get caught in thinking that, being Socratic is manipulating the words. And, and, and that's where I, I, I'm very influenced very early in my life by general semantics. You know, Alfred Korzybski's, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, crankish theories from the 30s, but with a great deal of, of truth in them that, uh, you know, I, I, I've always loved his idea of what he called the structural differential, which is this tool that he built for people to kind of say, where are you in the process of ab abstracting? You know, his, his basic message was reality is infinite. You know, and he, he represented that with this parabola. You know, and he would literally say, you make this thing out of cardboard. I made one when I was a kid and I read Science and Sanity. I was 14 years old. And, uh, uh, you know, you make this parabola. It's got all these little holes with strings coming down. It comes down to this circle. And the circle is, represents the fact that we have an experience of, of that infinite reality. And so there's various things that we take out of the infinite and bring down into our experience. And so we'd represent that by strings coming from these holes in the parabola. And then we have words that we use to describe it. And so often when people think about philosophy or when they think about ideas, they're simply rearranging the words. I just had this discussion with Max Tegmark, right? Because he he talks about the mathematical universe and the ultimate reality being mathematics or mathematical in nature. Whereas I quoted to him Alan Watts, who says that, uh, you know, uh, whether philosophers who live in the realm of words or mathematicians who live in the realm of numbers, because those are merely reflection or representation of real objects, they actually live by definition in the realm of illusion. Whereas reality, according to Alan Watts, is this. And you can't really give it a name. I mean, you can put some mathematical formula or some kind of way to represent it, but it's not the thing. It is a representation of the thing. Yeah, I, uh, um, yeah Wallace Stevens talks about this. Uh, reality is the beginning, not the end. The naked alpha, not the hierophant omega. He had this idea that we, we, you know, we elaborate on reality with our words, with our uh, stories about it. Uh, and it's as if the air, the midday air, was thronging with the metaphysical changes that occur merely in living as and where we live. 
yeah, I, I love that. That you know, we have we keep coming. You know, again, a great poem, line from his poem, "An Ordinary Evening in New Haven." We keep coming back and back to the real, to the hotel, and not the hymns that fall on it out of the wind. Uh, you know, and then this this uh, you know this one line where he talk, you know there's all this imagination. And he says the statues go back to being things about. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, this uh, reminds me again to Alan Watts, who says that in a way, all poetry is trying to say what cannot be said in words. Yeah. Because, I mean, how can you capture love or suffering or pain or loss in words? I mean, you can try and, and poets have done tremendous attempts to accomplish it, but it still only gives us a tiny glimpse. It doesn't give us the real thing. Well, I think poetry reminds us that words are pointers. Like music, art, or all of those things. Yeah, they're pointers. And, and, and people mistake them for the thing itself. Exactly. That's so fantastic. Um, so we, we only have a couple of minutes here left before I, I kind of transition us to talking to your book. So let me throw in a couple of quick personal questions. You were the person who set up the original meeting where uh, the, 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 the term open source was accepted and started being used uh, from then onwards, uh, coined by Christine Peterson, who also has been on my show before. Are you a Linux user then? No, I was actually, I came more out of the Berkeley Unix side of, uh, uh, of the Unix tradition. I mean, I have used Linux. And today? Uh, today, uh, mostly, Mac, mostly Mac. Mostly Mac. But isn't that like kind of a ironic in a way? In what way? Well, you helped coin, not coin, but establish and popularize the term open source. Yeah, I mean, but but again, part of what I the, what I what I brought to that discussion, which I thought was important, was that I, I said to people, "You're talking too much about Linux. It's not the only thing that, in fact, it's not the most important thing that open source has done." You know, and, and I, I, what I argued about was that there was this narrow political definition that had been started by Richard Stallman and the Free Software Foundation, yeah. and so Linux fit that because it was under the GPL and, uh, you know, GCC and Emacs. And so that's what they talked about. And I said, wait a minute, over here, there's this thing called the World Wide Web. That was put into the public domain. You can't get freer than that. You know, why aren't you talking about that? And then all of the Berkeley Unix tradition, which actually, you know, the TCP IP that we all used to get on the early Internet came out of the Berkeley stack. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I, and I basically, I, I'd come to Unix, uh, you know, on, on BSD 4.1. So, uh, you know, I, and I'd been around, actually both been around both Unix, uh, BSD and System 5. And I'd watched, even though e AT&T, uh, you know, had a proprietary license, it was still this big swarming party where people brought all this stuff to you know, the party. And I, I, again, I was much more in the, on the, the internet side, and I was like, why are you not making the internet the heart of the open source story? And so the reason why, and of course that resonated and it made open source much more safe. And actually bringing it back to philosophy, uh, I've also been a huge fan of Lao Tzu, the, the, the Chinese philosopher. And uh, in particular, there's a passage where he says, losing the way of life, men rely on goodness. Losing goodness, they rely on laws. Wow. And I, I always thought, well, the Free Software Foundation is trying to rely on laws. And I was trying to say, actually, I think open source, what we need to find is the way of life. And what I interpret that in, in, in practical terms in, in a business context, uh, you know, not a personal you know, life context, but in a business context, is figuring out what really works. And so the search for me with open source and this kind of goes back to what I said about Plato earlier, was the search for truth. And it was the search for what, is, what really drives this? And it was, okay, well, community drives it. Okay, well, it's actually the language of a network community. It's about the way that, that when you have a network, it's natural to share. You know, so I was trying to search out you know, what was really driving this phenomenon, and then also how it would change. And, of course, one of the ideas I came to was this idea that, uh, you know, 
when one thing becomes a commodity, something else becomes valuable. And that led me down the path to saying, oh, well, if the internet and open source commodify old proprietary software, uh, something else will become valuable. And, and that was what led me to say, you know, uh, as I said in my Web 2.0 days, data is the intel inside. And, you know, I, I actually kind of had this line. I said, Web 2.0 begins with collective intelligence and it ends with monopoly with data becoming, <laughs> uh, you know, the intel inside. And I was kind of like, if you want to be worried about freedom, that's the freedom, that's the next battle of freedom. And sure enough, it has been. You know, we now have vast repositories of data and the people who have the most data are in the, in the controlling position and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're squeezing us in the same way that Microsoft did in its days of proprietary software. So, uh, you know, so again, I was just trying to find what seemed true to me. Brilliant. So uh, let me ask you a couple of questions about the Singularity, because, of course, my show is called Singularity FM. So what's your take on the Singularity and how do you define it? You know, I am not a Singularity fan. Uh, and, and that's not to say that the future will not be incomprehensible to us uh, in some ways. You know, I, I, I do think that the fundamental idea that, um, you know, th th there could be something, uh, you know, a radical discontinuity. I, I'm not, not opposed to that idea. What I am opposed to, or, or not, not sold on, is the idea that we're on this inevitable and rapid path towards it. Mm -hmm. I have an ongoing debate with uh, Robin Hansen on that. <laughs> yeah. Whether we can influence the future or not. My argument was, yes, of course we can, even though it may be very hard, but if anyone, that's got to be us. And if not now, then when? His argument was kind of fluctuating between kind of it's impossible in the worst case and in the best case, it's probably very, very hard to influence the future. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it's actually uh, people do it all the time. We all do it together. And uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, it's very hard to necessarily create the effect that you want but each of us influences the future and some people more than others. Uh, you know, it's very hard for me to say that, uh, you know, when Larry and Sergey decided to, you know, create a better search engine that they didn't influence the future, you know, somebody, Oh, well, it would have been inevitable. Somebody would have, would have done it anyway. Maybe, um, uh, there's definitely pathways that the world goes down and you look at choices that were made, you know, you think about World War II. Right? You know, um, Winston Churchill was asked, uh, what, what should we call this war? And he said, the unnecessary war. You know, because <laughs> you know, if they had made better choices after World War I, World War II would never have happened. You know, we look at how we dealt with, you know, Europe after World War II, where we, you know, we uh, invested in our former enemies. And yeah, we had the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan versus the you know, what happened after the Treaty of Versailles was they basically beggared the Germans and, and uh, you know, and, and look at our current politics. John Maynard Keynes wrote a, a lot about that after, right after World War I, and he was a big opponent of punishing Germany so severely. Yeah, uh, it's totally right. And, and, you know, so here's an example where we made the wrong choice. And, uh, you know, so I, I but, but mainly it's just looking at history. And the, 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 the biggest argument I have with um, singularity thinking is that it, uh, because it puts this patina of inevitability on it, it, um, it takes us away from the focus that we should have on the choices that we need to make. Because if we make the wrong choices, and there's plenty of evidence that we are, that uh, you can have the world stand still, you know, at least on the axes you care about for a very long time. And I, I actually look at, for example, the you know, Roman history, you know, and you got a lot was lost, you know. And yes, there were new things that were discovered. The Middle Ages were not entirely the Dark Ages and there were, you know, great social changes. But, for example, 
You know, uh, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul was the largest building in the world for a thousand years. They didn't get any better at it, you know? Uh, uh, and that's a long time in human timescales. So what if that were, you know, you know, so I imagine some pretty possible dark futures uh, where, and actually I wrote a piece once about uh, climate change and Fermi's paradox, you know, uh, and, and it was not that, you know, necessarily humanity goes extinct, which is also a possibility, but simply we could have a dark age from which it's very hard to recover because we have used all the cheap energy and we can get back up to the Victorian level, but we can't get to the level of energy intensity that would let us, you know, rediscover and recreate digital computers, for example. You know, so we could have the Victorian internet, but we couldn't have the you know, in some far future, because, hey, you know, we've depleted all the easy, uh, you know, energy, and we just can't build an energy intensive civilization. Again. Now, it's not impossible, but, uh, you know, that you go down another path, but it, it's just, there's a lot of pathways that could lead us, you know, in very different directions. And this idea that we're on this inevitable march uh, to some, you know, progress. I mean, look at evolutionary history. I mean, I think it's clear that it's not a tale of progress. It's a tale of change. And that's exactly where I think uh, ethics comes in, because you see, I, I agree entirely with you, and which is the whole purpose and, and reason why I started doing what I do, is because my whole argument... So we have this kind of indirect d debate with Peter Diamandis. So Peter says that there is no all of humanity's grand challenges and all of the problems we face can be solved by two things, he says. One is the proper application of technology and the other is capital, which uh, in my books is another technology because money was invented by us and it's a kind of technology that we use to allocate resources. So basically he says with the right technology to simplify it, you can accomplish anything. My claim is technology is necessary, but it's not sufficient. It's not enough because look at everything. I mean, we have all the resources to solve or we know how to address or at least start addressing global warming today, but we're not doing it. We, we have all the resources to stop throwing plastic in the oceans, but we're not doing it and all of those things. So it's not just technology and it's not just capital. That's been my claim. Whereabouts do you line on that debate? Oh, I, I'm very much with you. I, I think uh, fundamentally... Uh, you know, we need to be, uh, we need an ethical revolution in as much as anything. We need to actually understand how to, you know, we've developed enormous capabilities and we have to figure out how to use them to make a, a great society. And I, I think, you know, if you look at history, there are periods that are wonderful flowerings and then there are periods that are pretty dark. And it's, it's actually interesting. I read a really interesting uh, piece by um, Freeman Dyson recently. <laughs> I interviewed George some time ago. Yeah, well, if you ever get a chance to interview Freeman, what an interesting mind. Uh, but he wrote this review of Jeffrey West's book about scale. And uh, he started out with an odd little, what seemed like an odd little side note about genetic drift versus um, versus uh, selective pressure, right? And it was just really the idea that actually in smaller communities, you have a higher mutation rate, you know, because uh, mm -hmm. they concentrate. And, and so he just kind of throws that away. And then he kind of goes through Jeffrey's whole thing about why scale is better and is this sort of bigger and bigger cities and, you know, and he said, well, look, actually, if you look at the great fertile periods of, um, uh, of human history, you know, you look at ancient Athens or you look at, at Florence in the Renaissance or you look at early America, they were actually fairly concentrated populations. And it's actually, and it kind of comes back to this idea of genetic drift in small populations, because that's where you get this sort of incredible variation that accelerates. And so here was this view of, from evolutionary biology that would also kind of apply to, you know, some of these ideas, you know, as we build, uh, you know, to a civilization of global scale, 
uh, do we in fact eliminate one of our sources of innovation, which is uh, what people do in isolated, uh, you know, uh, subcultures that are cut off. Out of necessity. Yeah, and if I look at my career, it's been around finding these isolated communities. You know, it was like nobody thought the PC was going you know, gonna to be a big thing. You know, all the people who were in the computer industry, you know, I remember Ken Olson from Digital Equipment Corporation, the PC is a toy. You know, and and then the, you know, uh, you know, here's the, the the world of Windows, and and you know, they didn't get the internet, and it, the internet was brought to us by a bunch of people who were just doing it for the love of it, and uh, you know, you look at the way the crypto community just sort of got over the edge. All the people who were doing synthetic bio are not the kind of the mainstream of, you know, so, um, you know, or, or or AI, you know, where the, the the deep learning guys were off in their corner and nobody was taking them seriously until suddenly, and, and the question is, you know, are we creating a society with that kind of innovative potential is one question. But the other is, are we creating a society that doesn't tear itself apart through, uh, you know, inequality? Because you can have, uh, uh, you know, a society that's a, a, a science and technology and economic powerhouse that's a, that's, that's a shit show. I mean, look at Nazi Germany. You know, they were... <laughs> You know, they were the kind of, uh, you know, uh, here was this you know, terrible economy that leading to this, you know, dictatorship while they were also the scientific leader of the world. And, um, you know, they actually drove out a lot of their scientists, which made it go somewhere else. Oh, you're doing that now. <laughs> uh, Einstein was shocked and disgusted how some of his smartest colleagues basically became obsessed obsessed uh, German nationalists almost overnight and didn't uh, see any trouble switching from their work to, say, producing weapons of mass destruction, like mustard gas or, or chemical weapons and so on and so on. Uh, which, uh, again, goes to my point that ethics is kind of like an operating system that we need to install all over our civilization. But let me, uh, and I just sort of, sort of to let you know where I'm coming from in it. I started this show 10 years ago almost uh, as a Singularity fanboy. And uh, as time kind of went through, I st and I, I started deeper and deeper into this, I started becoming more and more critical and starting sort of getting back to the roots and to the sort of Socratic sort of ways of investigation and, and seeing that, you know, we're limiting ourselves if we stick only to sort of the technology realm and ethics can so much to offer us. Uh, perhaps. Uh, so let me use this as a segue to your book. Um, I enjoyed reading this book tremendously this weekend. It's a phenomenal book. It's pretty substantial too. So let's start with the title and break it into two parts or three parts. First, WTF. WTF, Tim. What the fuck? <laughs> so WTF is an expression that people use uh, in two ways. And probably the dominant way is WTF, uh, you know, that's not okay, you know. But they also have a WTF that's like, whoa, that's amazing. You know, uh, that's unbelievable. And so we see both in technology. <clears throat> and one of the themes that <clears throat> I try to run through the book, and actually I, I, I kind of switch from the you know, WTF metaphor to the, the unicorn story. <laughs> via a, a wonderful passage from Tom Stoppard, the playwright, where he talks about a unicorn, and you first see it, and it's magical. And the more people see it, the more commonplace it becomes until it becomes as thin as reality. And you go, well, that is exactly what happens with unicorns. I was talking with Keller Renato, the, the, the CEO of Zipline, recently, and he said, you know, like, they, they're now, their they're drone deliveries of blood and medicine in Rwanda are kind of commonplace. People used to be, oh, my God, what's that? You know, they see this drone flying overhead and dropping a parachute. And now they kind of expect that's how you deliver blood and medicine. You know, it's just like that's how it works. And you think about, you know, back, you know, 100 and, you know, 30, 40, you know, whenever they were first, you know, like Buffalo was the city of light. It was Silicon Valley. It was WTF, you know. <laughs> Like, what is that? What is the what, what are these shining things? 
You know, it's not whale oil. It's it's something else. What is it? Magic. And now it's like you know, it's cheap. It's not it's something we take for granted. And and I think in some sense, <clears throat> we're actually you know you know when I think about Silicon Valley, I think you know we will be Buffalo or Detroit at some point. And you know, people will go, oh yeah. yeah, remember when Silicon Valley was a big thing? And, and the future will be happening somewhere else. That's why I'm so concerned when we have this kind of wholesale effort right now, in my view, trying to export Silicon Valley all over the world and make everyone else copy and paste the Silicon Valley model. In my view, uh, and, I, and I actually wrote a piece uh, some time ago called Why Politics is, uh, is the Future of Technology and Technology is the Future of Politics. Um, and, and, and there I argued that basically... You know, Silicon Valley has a lot more to learn than to give the world, in my opinion, because if we follow the, their idea that all we need is uh, uh, the best technology and, and, and capital, Silicon Valley has the best, the largest number of both billionaires and endless technology. And yet it doesn't seem to help. Like when I was traveling through California, I was shocked by the wholesale poverty I was seeing everywhere. There's people camping there today, just like people were camping in the Great Depression. But by the thousands, sometimes maybe tens of thousands, I was shocked. And you look at uh, environment, you look at um, social cohesion, you, you look at the rates of crimes. Clearly, that didn't help. But there are other places in the world uh, w which have a lot less technology and a lot less uh, uh, capital. And yet you don't seem to find those kinds of problems there. So in my opinion, clearly, it's not the case that technology and capital solve everything. They're very necessary. They're required, but they're not sufficient. I 100% agree. And, and which is kind of ironic because California is called the golden state. And yet, if you actually uh, take uh, and uh, technically it's like the 11th poorest state in the United States. But if you actually take the, the cost of living into consideration, it becomes the poorest state in the United States, actually. Because when you compare just numbers per numbers, you know, it's number 11. But if you live in the middle of Missouri or Alabama or something, the cost of living is nothing like in San Francisco, obviously. So, so, so once you take price uh, comparison, then it becomes by far the poorest state, which I think is shameful. And, 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 and horrible. That's why I'm so shocked and, and scared that, you know, people trying to bring uh, Silicon Valley here in Canada, for example, that worries me, to be honest with you. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so let's talk about the second part of your title or the subtitle. What's the future and why it's up to us? Let's break it into two parts. What's the future, Tim? Well, you know, it's it's funny because in some ways the uh, the title of the book uh, uh, is probably deceptive because the book really isn't about what's the future. It's really much more about how to think about the future um, and and how to see it in the present. Because maybe the future is a process rather than a place. That, that's right. You know, and, and I've read a lot of books where somebody prognosticates to say this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. And that's not really what I try to do. Uh, you know, what I really try to do is to say, here are things that are happening today. And you can ask yourself, what happens if this goes on? Uh, so it's really about identifying vectors that you can kind of see the line. This is going here, this is going here. And, and the future is the sum of a lot of vectors. And it, it's really about how do we uh, recognize those things earlier? Uh, I, I love the, the phrase from William Gibson, which I think I've probably been the chief popularizer of. I think he said it once on a radio program. I heard it and started quoting it. And now everybody kind of uh, uses it all the time, which is the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. And, um, you know, so often, you know, like when you think about the World Wide Web, you know, when we first started writing about it in 1992, there were 200 websites. But those of us who were there in the early web were already living in the future. You know, uh, it just wasn't obvious to everybody that that was the future yet. Yeah, you you had the first commercial website, we should add, or I should add for my audience who may not know that. Uh, you know, when, when you know, Google, I still remember, you know, when Google was taking off and I was like, wow, we really got to start publishing books on, you know, on how Google operates, you know, and all these things about big data and all the stuff about uh, uh 
uh, you know, the, the sort of operations that they do inside of, you know, these vast, I never saw, well, Google's a unique case, you know, everybody doesn't have to do that. It's just a specialized, and it's like, no, this is the future, you know, and of course, uh, you know, you look around and you say, well, right now there are people who are doing genetic engineering and, uh, you know, George Church is very definitely living in the future. And we're going to look back and go, wow, why did we not take that more seriously? There were a bunch of people saying, could we bring extinct species back to life? Uh, could we generate a new human brain tissue for, uh, you, know, um, you know, you know, fixing people with Parkinson's? Could we, uh, you know, do germline editing? You know, I believe, you know, back to the singularity, I think, you know, if there's there's far more chance of a biological singularity than there is of a digital singularity. This is a, for instance, where we engineer ourselves into a different species. Absolutely, yeah. And, and this is one of the questions that I've been investigating, which is the very meaning of what it is to be human. Because my argument has been that technology is a magnifying mirror. It's, it's amoral until you apply it, then becomes either moral or immoral. And it's a mirror because it, it doesn't have an essence of its own. It merely reflects whatever it is that we project in it. But it's not a perfect mirror because it has this amplification, it magnification effect. And if there's one thing that's for sure is that there's always unintended con consequences, <laughs> which makes it so much trickier. But going back to George Church, I interviewed him here on the podcast and um, I gave him the criticism of Francis Fukuyama, who said that transhumanism is the most dangerous idea in the world. And uh, George Church's response was that inactivity and complacency were the most dangerous ideas. Just like assuming that doing nothing would keep you safe and protected uh, is a most dangerous idea in his view. Yeah, I'm with George. <laughs> so, so let's go back again to your book, though. Um, so in a way, you say that the, you agree with me that the future is more of a process than a place and it's not inevitable. But what are the major trends and or people at the fringes that you pay attention to and that we should be paying attention to other than George Church, perhaps? Well, I think the things that I think are going to shape our future more than we uh, have, have grokked yet, climate change is, is far and away at the top of the list. And whether you take the most alarmist you know, possibilities of climate change or whether you just take where we are today, you know, this idea that it has to be utterly catastrophic or business as usual, uh, I, I think is, uh, misses the point. I, I recently uh, met a couple of, of classicists, actually. Uh, there's been a revolution in classical archaeology uh, through science. Uh, uh, Professor Mike McCormick at Harvard, uh, Malcolm Weiner, who's uh, actually a kind of independent, formerly former currency trader, who's taken his fortune and funded uh, archaeology for the last 40 years. Uh, they've been researching the connection between climate change and the fall of ancient Aegean civilizations, climate change and the fall of Rome. And it's astonishing, you know. Uh, and let's let's go to the work on the fall of Rome. Turns out there were three volcanic eruptions. Uh, uh, within 10 years uh, that led to this very, very cold period. That's what led the migration of the Huns who brought with them bubonic plague, right? So you have the plague of Justinian. Uh, basically, and you have Rome, you know, the fall of Western Rome, you know, Rome goes from a million people uh, to 50,000 people over that, that, you know, that period, you know, so like, and it was sort of like, again, you think about, you know, if you've read 1491 and the speculation about what happened to the Native Americans when, you know, uh, the diseases came, you know, and, and, and so you, you look at effectively the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you know, you had a climate event, which, uh, you know, put enormous economic pressure. You know, Justinian had stored up 10 years worth of, of grain, wasn't enough, you know. Uh, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, then mass migrations and warfare. You have plague. And you go, well, you know, we could have that same thing. You could make the case that, you know, in fact, people have made the case that, you know, climate played a role. You know, the big drought in Syria that led to some, was one more contributing factor in the warfare, leading to these migrations which are destabilizing Europe, pushing America in the direction of, of uh, you know, uh, of, of fascism, you know, and, and protectionism. 
you know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What happens when there's not just 10 million people trying to move because where they're uh, living is not so, so great, uh, but it's 100 million people? You know, we're not prepared for that even remotely. And it will take enormous foresight, enormous forethought uh, for our civilization to, to get through uh, in intact and in, in a recognizable form. That doesn't mean that people won't survive. I mean, in the case of, of Rome, the Eastern Roman Empire lasted for another you know, thousand years. The, um, Until the 1450s, I think. Yeah, exactly, which is sort of astonishing. Uh, uh, but it became very different. Uh, and, and certainly there was a, a renewal in the West. It didn't, you know, you look at, uh, at uh, the changes that happened. They were not, you know, they didn't last forever. And, and we, we built, you know, humans, you know, kind of rediscover and rebuild. Um, but it becomes, it's much more cyclical. And if we're really going to, uh, you know, I, I, I think we need to be far more proactive and so I, you know, I think about things like uh, how are we going to turn climate refugees into settlers? You know, how are we going to say what will we really do if we were trying to resettle, uh, you know, 10 million people instead of well, we'll let in, you know, 10,000 and try to integrate them into our society, and the rest of them are going to be parked somewhere. You know, what would we do if we, you know, there's already been. Uh, you know, there's huge areas of, of the you know, continental U.S. that, for example, that are relatively depopulated. And you kind of go, could we, in fact, uh, be proactive and say, we're going to do something about that? You know, because there's probably 10 million people who would say, well, we can come, come settle that area. It'll be hard, but we'll be settlers. You know, I mean, and, we, and for all the, the things that are horrible about Israel came and did that you know, by by ejecting the people who were there, you know, previously. But, you know, that idea that they, they basically took a refugee population and turned them into settlers and built a prosperous society. And I go, could we do that without, you know, a mass migration? Again, going back to archaeology and this, this data, it's not just climate uh, data that they've got from ice cores. It's also genetic data. And one of the things you look at the history, you know, they, they've now found that the People of Stonehenge, through genetic analysis, the people uh, there's a point where all of the males were killed, right? That's what happened in in ancient history. You know, you'd have this mass migration, and somebody would win, and all the men were killed, and they took the women, and they they built, you know, they, they go, okay, we 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 moved into the, the you know the, the the land that's that that's good, and a lot of those migrations were triggered by climate events. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's sort of interesting. Um, so that's one piece. That's sort of the dark side. On the plus side, I think that there's a, a wonderful set of possibilities in the systems that we are building. And this is a thread that runs through my book, and I've been continuing to develop and think about. And that is when you look at a vast algorithmic system like you know, what Google has done with search or Facebook is doing you know, with its social networking, you know, or our financial markets. These are vast network systems that represent digitally mediated, you know, composite organisms made up of millions or billions of human beings. You know, it's, it's kind of this idea that I, I've been really exploring for the last 20 years. It's like we're building a global brain. And that brain can do things that we could not do before. And, uh, and uh, there's a phrase I, I heard recently from, or a sentence that I heard recently from a guy named Paul Cohn. He's a former DARPA program manager, who's now the head of the, he's the dean of the School of Information Sciences at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, we were both at a, 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 um, a, you know, a session on AI at the National Academies. And he said something that I wrote down and I've been quoting ever since. He said, the opportunity for AI is to help humans model and manage complex interacting systems. And we can do that. And, and there are people who are starting to work on this. Carla Gomez uh, at Cornell uh, was a professor there. She started something called the Institute for Computational Sustainability. And they're doing amazing work around 
taking more factors into account. You know, so they're working with the Brazilian power company. Which tributary of the Amazon should you dam? You don't just look at economic factors, you know, like, well, how much power do you want to generate? Turns out that where you cite it, uh, you know, if you take into account enough factors, you know, like, um, uh, you know, species uh, 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 you know, being, being, being damaged, people forced to move, you can actually have a better economic outcome and you can generate more power at lower cost. You just basically have to do more math. You know, just in the same way that Google built a better search engine by doing more math, that where they could take more factors into account. But isn't that what Yuval Noah Harari calls dataism? And he even says that it's a new religion. That's basically the idea that with enough data, we can solve any problem. And it's all just a matter of data. No, I don't think it, it's, it's uh, I, I, I don't buy that. Uh, because, of course, data is just a tool. Um, you know, can we model and manage more complex systems? That's kind of like saying, well, oh my God, you know, airplanes, that's just dataism, you know, but actually when we figured out the airflows over wings and did the math, you know, we were able to build better airplanes. I'm sorry, you know, math as a way of understanding the world uh, and, and, and data as a way of understanding the world lets us model and manage things that we couldn't do before. No, there's no debate about that. But the point is how exactly you're applying. So, for example, if you're talking about airplanes, if you send those fantastic airplanes to World War II afterwards, then your mass is kind of besides the point. It's more detrimental. Of course. But I mean, the, the point is that, that what I'm saying, we have these tools. Can we point them at the right problems? And, and that maybe cannot be directed by data or can it? Of course not. No, I, that, that, that is, in fact, uh, you know, that comes from comes back to the earlier part of our conversation that comes from our aesthetic and moral vision. And that's kind of the, the, the why it's up to us part of my title. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm pushing towards. Yeah. The choices we make about how to use the technology, the superpowers that we're developing for ourselves uh, are critical. You know, if we use those simply to enrich a small number of people uh, with this sort of, you know, really you know, we have a story that says, you know, the Peter Diamandis story, you know, like if you have enough technology and you have enough capital, it'll sort of trickle down. You know, well, no, it doesn't trickle down naturally. You know, you have to actually um, design a system to take more factors into account. And, and that's, again, part of what I've been trying to do is, uh, you know, since I wrote the book, I've been trying to do further research on two-sided markets and, um, you know, big internet marketplaces and going, okay, how do we make them more robust? Well, we make them more robust by taking the needs of all the stakeholders into account. Well, let me, let me uh, even re re go a little deeper on this second part, why it's up to us, because this is also where I entirely agree with you, but, but also I have this debate with Robin Hanson, who is this tremendous economist who wrote The Age of M. Um, and, and, he argues that influencing the future is at best super very hard. What do you what do you respond to that? Why is it up to us? I mean, he would say only a one percent of a one percent of a one percent maybe can do something, right? Because I, my argument against his book was like, look, Robin, in my opinion, things can be a lot worse than you describe them, or they can be a lot better, and it all depends on what we're going to do now. And his response is, ah, no, this is how it's going to be because if you look at the trends and the way things play out, it's not going to be at one extreme end or the other. The economist, economics says it's going to be here. And most of us, it's very hard to influence the future. What do you say to that? I say that, that economic determinism is probably the cardinal sin of the present moment. Uh, you know, I look... And, I, and it's funny because my book is about technology, but it is about historical choices. And for example, I cite the high school movement, you know, which started, you know, bottom up. It was, you know, high school in America started like the open source movement. You know, it was like some people who said, we, we want to do this thing. Like our kids, uh, you know, are, are uh, you know, are not going to be on the farm anymore. You know, we got to educate them 
for for you know for for the jobs of the future. And, and it was a movement. It, it wasn't like some government you know uh, decided. You know, it's, it's, I think it started in Massachusetts, but then it really took hold in Iowa, which at the time was actually the richest state in the country. I didn't know that. Uh, and so in wow. 19, 1909, 9% of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, eligible age kids went to high school, you know, to some equivalent of high school. It was an elite pursuit. And by 1939, it was 70%. So over 30 years, it was this, this movement that just kind of like, oh, we're going to actually tax ourselves and build schools. That's why you know, school districts are, are, are funded locally, because it was a local grassroots movement. You know, and I go, so here's this amazing story of people collectively deciding to make a choice that would affect the future. And we had the New Deal also and so on. Yeah, well, that, that was more of that, that the, 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 the New Deal is more of the model that we're, we're kind of familiar with with government, which is, you know, led at the national level, top down. But the high school movement really was a bottom up local movement. And that's really, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, quite wonderful. And, and you look at the many movements that, you know, are started by one person and then another person joins them and then another and uh you know you, you look at the civil rights movement this was was a struggle it was a lot of people working towards it you don't think that changed the future i personally do and i actually think that people like you personally and professionally have a very good history that shows that it's possible and that it has been done and and if you look around us actually one thing good thing about silicon valley is there's a few people like you there who have made made an impact or a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs used to say. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's possible, and those are the kinds of people we want, and we just want them to be caring not about perhaps clicks and and sort of Wall Street money, but about a grander, longer term vision, in my view. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right, and so I think we have to believe that we can affect the future. Uh, we have to believe it, because if we don't believe it. We don't act. And, uh, you know, there's a poem that I'm very, very fond of uh, uh, from uh, Rainer Maria Rilke called The Man Watching. And he, he um, you know, this is not an exact quote, but I, I, I feel I, I can take, I read it in Robert Bly's translation and I've kind of modified it somewhat. I figure it's, it's not the original anyway. So, but it's, it's talking about, uh, uh, the wrestlers of the Old Testament, Jacob among them, wrestling with angels. And they, they know they can't win. You know, and Rilke says, you know, what we fight with is so small. And when we win, it makes us small. What we want is to be defeated by successively greater beings. <laughs> and, and I love that um, because, you know, we struggle with... You know, it's like, like you think about the, the typical Silicon Valley startup that's, you know, the, you know they, they, they talk about, well, we're going to change the world. But really, it's, it's about getting to the exit. You know, it's like what we fight with is so small. And when we win, it makes us small. I mean, Jeff Hammerbacker's uh, great quote, you know, the best minds of my generation are, are, are teaching people to click on ads. And I think that's, you know, uh, that's kind of a waste. Yeah, I forget exactly what the last part of it was. I know. I went to this meeting that I told some some tech geeks that if they go end up working for Facebook, I'd be ashamed of of, the, of myself if I did that, being so smart as they were. And they were looking at me like, you know, that was their dream. They just want to go work for Facebook. And I was like, for what? What what amazing thing is are they doing? And And I mean, look at the elections. Look at all of that. Do you want to be a part of that machine? And I, I think at this point, you know, fixing Facebook is work that matters. <laughs> uh, fixing it is work that matters, but can a, a new sort of employee do that kind of job? Yeah, I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting question. But in any event, I mean, I do think that there's a, uh, by the way, uh, somebody who you should have on your podcast is a guy named Anand Jared Haradas. He's got a new, he's got a new book coming out in, uh, uh, September, I think, or maybe it's August, but it's called uh, Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World. Uh, and his, his basic point is that uh, 
and, and it's really in some ways a, a, a refutation of what you were saying earlier from Peter Diamandis, uh, you know, which is we have created a, a world of, of profound inequality, you know, and we're going to have to actually make some deeper changes. You can't just give back while continuing to do the things that have set the problem in the first place. And it's not just inequality. So you think about climate change. You know, we can't, um, uh, you know, go on as we are and just kind of tweak it around the edges. Now, I do think there's a lot that can be done with technology, but in the end, uh, we are going to have to reinvent our civilization. And we are, you know, back to the book that you're working on, we are going to have to have a new vision of how the world could work. You know, there's, there's another book I love right now, uh, Kate Raworth's Donut Economics, you know, where she's talking about this idea that, you know, we have this idea of growth that always goes up and to the right. And she's like, no, actually, the, the right way to think about economics is that there's a habitable zone. Uh, you know, it was kind of like the, the Earth is in a habitable zone. She doesn't use that. But she, the Goldilocks. The donut, the Goldilocks zone. But, you know, in economics terms, there's economic undershoot. People don't have enough to eat. They don't have access to opportunity. They don't have health care. They don't have shelter. Uh, uh, and on the other side is economic overshoot, climate change, species loss, et cetera, et cetera. He says, the job of economics is to help keep us in the donut. And, and I actually see that also in Silicon Valley. You know, Microsoft didn't stay in the donut. You know, they, they, you know, because they were pursuing growth at all costs. At some point when the growth of the PC market slowed, they consumed the ecosystem. They basically took all the vitality out of the market. Now yeah. Google's doing that to the web, you know, uh, mm -hmm. becoming increasingly monopolistic. You know, one of the things I've been looking at since I wrote the book, I've been going through Google's financial statements, for example. And, you know, in 2004, when they went public, half of their revenue came from advertising on third party websites. It's now down to 18 percent, mm -hmm. you know, because more and more services are delivered directly through Google. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and you look at that and you go, if you think long term, you can see Google is getting out of the donut. They're because they want to be the web. Yeah, you know, and, and the fact is just like Facebook. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I think that there's a really interesting point because you know, ex, you know, like if there were a model that said, well, there's a model of growth that's let's expand the habitable zone, right? That would be actually a really useful model where you go, yes, you can grow, but only if it expands the habitable zone. Anyway, back back to you know business, you know, case studies of you know, donut economics gone awry. You know, Uber took their drivers for granted. That became a bigger and bigger cost on the system because they, they weren't just an unlimited supply. They weren't, they were allocating too much of the value to uh, passengers and to themselves, uh, you know, in order to drive their, their valuation. And drivers were, were kind of a disposable resource until they weren't. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, a, 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 again, a case of getting out of the donut. And I think that we have to figure out how to do growth that uh, is robust and organic and takes <clears throat> many factors into account. Let me let me just grab that thought and then I want to come back to, yeah. the, to the Google and Facebook uh, examples. But, you know, if one thing that you convinced me here among many with your book is that I actually installed the Lyft app on my phone after reading your book. I've never used Uber for a number of ethical reasons uh, that I don't want to go into right now to waste time, but uh, you actually cover some of those, those reasons uh, in your book. So I want to ask you to explain to us two things. First, what is Uber as a platform? And second, how is Lyft better or at least different than Uber, which is the reason why I actually decided, well, I'm going to give this a try and I installed Lyft on my phone. Well, let, let me let me qualify it. Since I wrote the book, you know, obviously there's been a change in leadership at Uber, and I think they are becoming by more, force, <laughs> in yes, by force. But they are becoming more like Lyft now, in the sense that they they really are working very hard to to to, to actually do a better job with their drivers. And uh, I don't know that you know. At the time I wrote the book, there was a pretty stark choice. I mean, Travis was, you know, definitely, a, you know. Um, I was not a fan. Let me just say that. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, he may be a great entrepreneur, but if that's what we get from our entrepreneurs, that's not the world I want to live in. And uh, I do think that uh, you know the company is acting much more ethically. It's not to say that there aren't challenges. Uh, <clears throat> so what is Uber as a platform? So here's the thing that I think about uh, the, these on-demand platforms is they teach us something very important about the future of work. Uh, 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 several things, uh, and, and that's why I make them so central to the book. First off, they teach us that we're in increasingly in a world where humans and machines are working in concert. Uh, you know, and you could say, well, you know, a, a taxi cab driver is a human and a machine working in concert. They're driving, you know, it's a, you know, they're, they're, they're driving a car. Okay, but I'm talking about the digital dispatch. You know, so here is this system which allows us to summon a car on demand, uh, you know, to any location. And it's a marketplace. You have to have enough people on both sides of the market for it to work. So there's a big sort of, uh, there's a heavy lift to build up this, this network marketplace. And so this idea of a network marketplace mediated by technology is a design pattern that allows us to actually get more work done than the old model, which was, well, we'll have a limited supply only in the locations that are densest. Uh, and we'll basically have these little geographic regions. Uh, you know, well, now we have this network which allows us to do something that we couldn't do before. And that same network, for example, is that the same principles are now being used, for example, by Zipline to deliver blood and medicine in, in countries around the world, right? So it's literally not just about transportation, it's what else you can do with it. And then the other thing that's so important in the Uber and Lyft story is the worker is an augmented worker. The, the app actually is, a, is sort of a, a cognitive augmentation to the driver. You know, to be a taxi driver before the age of Uber and Lyft, you had to do a lot of learning. You had to learn your way around. You know, you did, you know, every once in a while you get a taxi cab driver who's leaping through the Rand McNally Atlas trying to figure out where that street was that you asked for. But mostly they spent, you know, a, you know, a year. And in, in the case of the, 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 the black cabbies in London, it's a three year training, which literally changes the brains of the taxi cab drivers. They become yeah. like Frank Herbert's Mentats. They literally could do turn by turn directions between any two points in London. You know, you don't have to do that anymore. The app does that for you. And that, to me, is a profound message about the future possibilities of, um, you know, partnerships between humans and machines. And, and so the restructuring of industries that becomes possible, you know, right now, and again, this is why the bridge between Uber and Zipline is so interesting, because in Rwanda, you don't have well-developed hospital infrastructure. There's a lot of places in the U.S. where you don't, too. You know, when I lived in Sebastopol in Sonoma County, the hospital closed. There wasn't enough demand. But here's this technology which lets you have smaller clinics distributed around the country with all the benefits of access to what you need. You know, you can drop in those blood supplies. You know, oh, you need some specialized, you know, uh, uh, RH negative blood. Bang, here it is, 15 minutes. Um, and, and now you think about Add in, you know, this cognitive augmentation. You can imagine a totally decentralized healthcare system uh, with small neighborhood clinics, with access telemedicine, with ac access to experts, uh, and th that kind of. And, and that's not the only place where you can imagine that. So you could imagine a very different economy matching up opportunity with needs, with people, with resources uh, in a much more effective way. And that's brilliant. That's utterly brilliant and, and, and to, to be commended. But now, in terms of the implication of that theoretical idea, you have two examples. One is the Uber examples with all its history and baggage and sort of ideology, if you will, even. And, and then you have the Lyft example. So tell me why Lyft is a little different than Uber. What makes them different? Well, I think the, the, the origin story of the two companies, uh, I think, is fairly critical. <clears throat> the origin story of Uber was two rich guys, they were already successful serial entrepreneurs who uh, you know, couldn't get a taxi 
they wanted to uh, so they wanted to summon a black car on demand. Uh, in fact, you know, Garrett Camp, who, who really came up with the idea, you know, had been basically hacking the the limousine system by just he would call multiple cars and then whichever one came first he would take and then he would just you know he had a long list of black car number drivers you know fairly kind of uh, uh, you know unethical routes selfish very, very entitled routes and uh, it was it was fortunate because by starting in the black car market they did figure some things out. Uh, they, they avoided the regulation because it's it, it's regulated differently. Uh, there was no street hail to compete with. You know, I mean, Taxi Magic, which had come earlier, had gotten all caught up in the knots of, uh, of, of sort of trying to replicate the taxi experience, whereas this just sort of bypassed that. But Lyft started from, we want to reinvent public transportation. You know, they were inspired by the Jitneys, and, and the, despite the fact that, uh, um, they had, they started with a company called Zimride, which is not named after John Zimmer, the co-founder with Logan Green, but after Z the, the Jitneys in Zimbabwe that they'd seen, which were just these crowdsourced, you know, public transit. And they had been trying to do that. And then they saw what Sunil Paul was doing with Sidecar. Uh, <clears throat> so he was actually the real visionary of this. He, he, he actually did a patent back in, uh, uh, 2002, I think it was, um, uh, for all the things that sort of showed up in Uber and Lyft, but he was too early and he so he decided it wasn't doable. And then after Uber was started doing it, and, uh, he kind of started a sidecar up, but he didn't raise enough capital. And then Lyft saw what he was doing and went, wow, this is great. And they basically rolled out the the, the peer to peer car sharing, spun Lyft out of Zim, what had been Zimride. And, uh, and then Travis eventually came about a year later to the peer to peer uh, model as opposed to just the black car model, you know, what we now call UberX. And so the, 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 the roots in public transportation versus, you know, elite transportation, I think, were, were part of that split originally. I think now uh, with under Dara, <clears throat> I think the values of the two companies are, are much closer aligned. And um, I think that they're both struggling with, uh, you know, the curse of what in the book I call super money. You know, I, this basically you've, you know, they've created this enormous valuation based on promises of world domination. And that means that they have to basically, you know, show growth. Uh, they have to show improving economics. And they become a slave to what in some ways is the hostile AI that rules our society, which is shareholder value. You know, it's this imperative. You must increase you know, growth. You must increase profits. You must increase shareholder value, even if it means that humans are a cost to be eliminated. And I worry about that despite, you know, I mean, while Lyft has always been tried to be more driver friendly, uh, both companies are now, you know, in this race. Uh, that's really a race uh, to get the, the you know their capital scorecard as high as possible, and I, I often think how different would this market be if there had not been this furious Silicon Valley capital uh, race? It's certainly possible that it would never have gotten the scale, you know, and, and, and that is something that capital is very good at. You know, you look at the way Amazon, you know, used capital to get scale and Uber and Lyft. I've really used capital to build this vast two-sided marketplace with sufficient supply of, of riders and passengers. But if it had grown organically, you know, might there be a, you know, a much more egalitarian system where drivers uh, were, you know, well, you know, much better compensated? And, uh, you know, we have a system. Actually, there's a, there's a wonderful book which I encountered after I wrote mine. Uh, I made a throwaway comment in my book where I said one day, you know, uh, future economic historians will look back, uh, uh, you know, wryly on this period uh, when we believe in the divine right of capital while looking back on our ancestors who believed in the <laughs> divine right of kings. Call and, Doctoral. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Is well, that not a quote from Doctoral? No, no, that's a quote from my book. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and but what was interesting was somebody wrote to me and said, well, have you read Marjorie Kelly's book, The Divine Right of Capital? 
And I hadn't, I never heard of it. It was written in 2001. And it's a wonderful book because she talks about, uh, she, she, the concept that I took from it that was most powerful was she talked about the way that, uh, you know, the, the, the right of capital is, is sort of embedded in the way we, we read our financial statements. You know, she says, look, the fundamental equation of a profit and loss statement is profit equals revenue minus expenses. Well, let's expand the expenses part of it. There's cost of materials, there's cost of labor, and there's cost of capital. And then we rewrote the equation so that profit equals return to capital. Why didn't we say profit equals return to capital plus return to labor plus return to materials? which of course is the triple bottom line when you think about it. And you go, wouldn't you want the return to be proportional to the actual value that you receive from each of those inputs? You know, why would it all go to capital? <clears throat> and of course, as a, you know, there's cases where capital deserves its return. I mean, Amazon would not exist without having raised enormous amounts of capital. On the other hand, you know, Google didn't need that much capital. You know, they started being relatively profitable, relatively early. Uh, you know, Apple you know, needed a capital infusion late in their life. You know, uh, Microsoft kind of kept them alive uh, because they needed them for antitrust purposes. And then they kind of became a monster. But at this point, capital gives nothing to Apple. You know, I mean, Apple gets its money from customers and is actually giving it to capital. Despite the fact that capital hasn't actually invested in the company in, in 20 years. Tim, we, we unfortunately, our time flew by so quickly and I can keep you here for another hour and a half. And I, ha I haven't even gone through a third of my questions, but we only have a couple of minutes left. So let me ask you, if you were to summarize the thesis of your book in a sentence, what's the thesis? Well, uh, unfortunately, there's not one thesis. It, it, it's like a layer cake. Um, you know, the, the, uh, there the are really four parts to the book. And, and in some sense, you could have, I could have written four books. The first, the first book is very much on how to think about the future, you know, and, and, and a set of techniques for, um, you know, recognizing the future in the present. The second part of the book is really about the nature of platforms and the nature of business today. And this is setting up really the second half of the book, which is the part that really uh, probably, if I, I do have a, a, a summary of, and it is that uh, we are basically living in a world ruled by vast algorithmic systems. And we can see how those algorithmic systems can go right, and we can see how they can go wrong. And the way that they go wrong is very similar to what people have described in their fears of AI, where... Uh, Nick Bostrom's famous paperclip maximizer, you know, the, the, uh, I, I actually prefer Elon Musk's version, which is the self-improving strawberry picking robot that eventually decides that humans are in the way of strawberry fields forever because <laughs> uh, uh, it's got a cute cultural reference in it. But, you know, this idea of the runaway objective function, you told this machine to do something and it does it even though it's no longer actually achieving what you would logically say it, you know, we, we gave it the wrong instructions. Uh, and so in, so the, the, the core message of the book is that our algorithmic systems often, you know, have what you could call the genie problem. You know, we gave, we had our three wishes, we gave them and we didn't phrase them quite right. And the machine went awry. That's another way of describing this paperclip maximizer problem. And so we can see how, Google mostly got search quality right. YouTube and Facebook have not, right? They, they, they basically have algorithms that are really running, running amok, you know, radicalizing people, uh, driving people to, uh, you know, to, um, uh, you know, conspiracy theories. I wish I can tell you what happened to me today on one of my videos that I shot with my own cameras, but I don't have the time, but it was horrendous. And yeah. And so, so I, I try to establish that, how algorithms go wrong in the third part of the book. And then the fourth part of the book is really, and guess what? Our financial systems 
and our economy are ruled by the same kind of rogue algorithm with the wrong objective function. And so ultimately, the book is an argument from technology about the economy and the failure of our financialized economy to address real human needs. And, 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 and so effectively, I, I, I'm making the cases just as computer platforms can go wrong if you give your machine the wrong instructions, we are living in an economic machine that is ruled by the wrong algorithm. And we need to rewrite the algorithm. Mm -hmm. I actually made a speech in Rotterdam once called uh, The Emperor Has No Clothes, uh, Socrates Deconstruct Singularity University, <laughs> where, where I argued precisely about that, that, that the underlying algorithm is deterministic in the sense that it provides certain kinds of out outcomes that where you have the best intentioned people in the world serving the wrong structure, the wrong algorithm. So instead of innovating at the algorithm or systemic level, they're preoccupied algorithm at the uh, innovating at the margins, and in the end, the outcome is marginal. I, you are so right. We, we are clearly thinking along the same lines. We have got to reinvent the world more profoundly than we have been doing. Uh, yeah, and, and that's ultimately, uh, I think, what we should all be engaged in. We have a new set of capabilities. Uh, we need to say, what could we do if we were starting fresh, if we wanted to make a better world? How would we do it? We write a new story. We write a new story that we unite behind, and then we go creating it. I think you're absolutely right. That is absolutely the challenge of the 21st century. We have to write a new story. I'm trying to write it now too, but it's not about me. So let me ask you, where can people find more about you and your work? Well, uh, you know, my professional, you know, my business is O'Reilly.com. Uh, this is basically, you know, books, conferences, online learning. I've got a, uh, a site called WTFEconomy.com that uh, sort of collects information, you know, related to the book and these, these themes of technology and the economy. It's also, uh, we, we have a weekly newsletter, the Next Economy Newsletter. Uh, which you can sign up for. And if you go to nexteconomy.com, uh, you'll find that there. I'm Tim O'Reilly on Twitter. Um, you can find me around lots of places. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you, you've been really generous with us, giving us 90 minutes of your time, and I'm very grateful for that. But we touched on so many things, and, and there are a few things that I couldn't touch on, things like hybrid AI and symbiogenesis, those ideas that are highly pertinent to my audience. So I recommend everybody reads your book to find out what those two things mean. But if you were to wrap up our conversation today and send us away with a single message, what would that be? Work on stuff that matters. Tim O'Reilly, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation.